English term B-E-B-U-N-G, vapung, was used to um, denote that tremolo effect. Vibrato effect. So like the smaller versions of the harpsichord, the spinet, and, and the virginal, this also had an oblong shape. And it was, it was more portable. Um, it was intended for use in a small room, so you really had to be up close to the instrument to hear it. But within this very soft dynamic range, you could make crescendos into many windows on the clavichord. And so that's something that you couldn't do with the harpsichord. So you can make crescendos and the mini windows even though it's within the soft dynamic range. All right, and so I think Johann, Johann Sebastian Bach said something like, you know, it took a decade to, you know, master the touch of this instrument. It was so um, sophisticated, and so that he really liked this, this uh, expressive capability. All right, so the youngest of the keyboard instruments is the piano. which was originally called the pianoforte. It was invented in 1709, so it has a specific date of invention. It was an Italian harpsichord builder whose name is Cristofori, who devised this hammer action. So it's, a, it's an adaptation of the harpsichord. So hammers strike strings. And because of the use of this hammer action, then the player could um, control the dynamic level. And so that's what the term piano forte uh, indicates, that you can play both softly and loudly on it, just depending on how much force you press the keys. These early instruments um, in the first half of the 18th century um, weren't particularly popular yet. So um, Bach had the opportunity to play some pianofortes, but he wasn't that impressed with them. There were still technical issues with the action that weren't totally worked out. Um, and it wasn't until the second half of the 18th century, so in the classical period, that the pianoforte rose in popularity, and then it completely um, eclipsed the harpsichord, and um, the harpsichord became more or less obsolete. And so the piano was undergoing these changes for about 150 years or so since it was first um, uh, invented, and. It was growing in range, so the, um, the well-tempered clavier, which is the monumental set of preludes and fugues by Bach, which we're going to talk about here in just a minute, was not composed for the piano, but instead was written for the clavichord, or it could be played on the harpsichord too, but it was written for an instrument that had a four-octave range. So, So the range went to two C's below middle C and then two C's above middle C, those four octaves. Then the, the, um, the Viennese piano that Mozart played, um, the Stein piano, was one that had a five octave range.
early Beethoven was, was composed for that. By the 18 teens then, um, the range was expanded to six octaves. There was a piano builder in London, his name was Broadwood, who gave Beethoven um, one of his instruments that was a six octave range. And he really liked it because it had then these extra bass notes um, and uh, treble notes. And we start to see triple stringing for the treble uh, notes for, for each pitch. And so the full range of the instrument um, then emerged in the Romantic era. And now we're used to the you know, basic standard 88 keys which there are even some instruments that extend the bass. Versendorfer piano that's made in Vienna has an extended bass, up to seven extra notes in the bass. So a couple of things to keep in mind when you see um, a recording and it says piano forte, that, that indicates it's on an earlier instrument, the, the type of instrument associated with Mozart and early Beethoven. And those instruments don't have cast iron frames, so they're made almost entirely of wood. And so they don't have the capability of using um, as thick of strings. So they can't um, you know, bear the pressure that the cast iron frame could, could withstand. And so in the 1820s, there were three really important developments for the construction. So the use of a cast iron frame and then the use of a cross stringing technique which um, employed um, separate ridges and that basically has to do with, with you know, this idea in which these bass strings are at an angle and then these treble strings here are strung so that they cross each other and this middle part of the, of the soundboard is called the crown, it's the thickest part and it has the most resonance and so that just enhanced the, the resonance quality of the instrument. So that was developed in the 1820s. And then a type of uh, action construction that's called double escapement allowed for faster repeated notes. So uh, just allow for more virtuosity. In general, the 19th century saw improvement in the construction of instruments with the addition of valves uh, for brass instruments um, so that it supported this increase in the amount of virtuosity that was, that was possible. All right, so... Um, you know, there are still builders that are experimenting with the design of the instrument with different things. Uh, basically, the model that's, that's been developed by Steinway, New York, Steinway, Hamburg, Germany are kind of you know, the standard uh, for piano construction. All right, so the most important collection of keyboard pieces in the Baroque period is the great monumental set that Johann Sebastian composed um, that he entitled the Well-Tempered Clavier. So he uses this, you usually see that French version of clavier rather than the K. And this the term well-tempered refers to the tuning of the instrument. And this had to do um, 
partly with the demonstration of the superiority of the well-tempered tuning, which more closely divided the octave into 12 equal half steps so that you could write a work in any major or minor key without having to retune the instrument. So the earlier type of tuning, the, the mean tuning, um, which was based on the pure uh, fifth, um, wouldn't allow the player to play in keys that were more than one sharp or one flat. And so you had to retune the instrument if you had to, you know, to, uh, to play in a key other than that. So, So well-tempered tuning is slightly different than equal-tempered, in which you do have an exact mathematical division of the octave into 12 equal parts, and that's what we're used to now is equal-tempered. Um, but this was the idea. So this set of preludes and fugues was written to, to demonstrate the superiority of this well-tempered tuning. And so what Bach did was to write a prelude and fugue in every major and every minor key. So there, there were 12 major preludes and fugues and 12 minor preludes and fugues. So there's 24 in the first book of the Well-Tempered Clavier. And he wrote two books. So in total, there are 48. So 24 in book one, which was composed in finished in So this is a huge monumental set. It really is um, a summation of the possibility of keyboard writing in the Baroque period. So Bach brings it all together in, in this great set for keyboard works. And it goes in this order of C major, so prelude and fugue in C major, and then in the parallel minor, C minor, and then C sharp major, C sharp minor, etc. It just goes chromatically through every key so that the last two are B major and B minor. So that's the way that they're organized in this set. One thing that was popular in the Baroque was to, as you remember, what the you know, doctrine of affection is to basically have one mood, one character per movement. But then Baroque composers liked to couple together things that were opposite and contrasting. And so the prelude and the fugue are contrasting types of keyboard pieces. The fugue is one of the more structured types. It's a polyphonic work and it has specific procedures that you expect to happen. So in a Bach fugue, um, there are certain things that you'll look for.
So this is more of a closed construction. In other words, there are definite things that you expect to happen. So it has more of a preconceived construction organization. Whereas with a prelude, it's more open. So there's lots of variety in the different types of preludes in the well-tempered clavier. So you have fewer preconceived notions. So the fugue becomes the most important polyphonic keyboard type of work for um, in, in the Baroque period. And the undisputed master of the fugue is Johann Sebastian Bach. He's by far the king of the fugue. So he wrote hundreds of fugues. I'm not sure how many he wrote in total, but a lot. And so the fugue was a type of work that was all about motivic thematic development. And so all the techniques that, that then occur in the, in the classical and romantic and 20th century music that have to do with thematic development and motivic construction and um, deconstruction of, of melodies. Um, you can trace back to the procedures that Bach mastered at the end of the Baroque era. So we'll put here. So these different contrapuntal compositional techniques that arose with the, the composition of fugues then became the basic tools for composers to develop their thematic material as a way that it, that it had a sense of coherence and is the intellectual aspect of the compositional uh, process, among other things too that you know, have to do with organizational uh, features. Um, so we've talked about a lot of these terms, but we'll just kind of review these now for a moment. Um, so you have things like melodic inversion. So that's just presenting a melody, that, but just going in the opposite direction as compared to the original version of that melody. You have, you have a technique that's called retrograde. That's just taking a melody, but presenting it backwards. And you can have retrograde inversions, so and you can combine those two ideas together. Do you have the techniques that are associated with rhythmic man manipulations, so diminution, augmentation, do you have the idea of piling up entrances, strato, we talked about that already. And so, all of these different techniques you can look for in the way that Bach manipulates his thematic material. So in a Bach fugue, the well-tempered clavier um, contains fugues that are